live. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric White, and I am with the DC Public Libraries, and um, where our solid branch, uh, the Bethel Duke branch, meets on a monthly basis during our season. And we'd like to welcome everyone to our program today with uh, Dr. Zinger Fraser, who you will be hearing from shortly. In the meantime, I hope that a number of you got a chance to participate in the virtual conference of ASALA, the Association for the Study of Afro-American Life and History, which will, actually the last session was on uh, Saturday, this past Saturday. And every Saturday, Thursday and Saturday during the month of September, there were phenomenal speakers and events that were taking place. And um, um, we are finding out whether or not some of those sessions that have been recorded, and all the rec sessions were recorded as this one is being recorded too, um, so that people can go back and possibly listen to those in the future. With that said, um, we would like you to Think about, after this presentation, reaching out to the Bethel Dukes branch uh, by sending us an email, uh, which we'll put in the chat if you're interested in joining our chapter to hear about future programs and speakers that we intend to host later on this year. Uh, next month, we will have our president, uh, Dr. Ida Jones, to speak. Um, and in November, we will have um, Marvin Jones, who is a local oral history historian who will be speaking. And uh, in December, we plan to celebrate Carter G. Woodson's birthday. And then we'll go on from there. There's a possibility that we might have another speaker, which we're waiting to hear, and we're keeping our fingers crossed uh, for October. Uh, especially during this heated election period that we're in. And uh, so we're looking forward to seeing if we get a response. If not, then we will have a good program planned for you for October. At this point, I'd like to turn the program over to our president, Dr. Ida Jones who will talk a little bit more about, you know, the conference that we just had in September and some of the things that Asal is doing and uh, as we move forward and get ready for our presentation today. So thank you and we look forward to uh, hearing, talking to you soon. Ida? Yes, good afternoon and thank you, Eric, for that uh, very ardent and passionate call for members. We are seeking to grow our branch, and I would like to welcome all of you who are viewing with us. We are in the virtual space as everyone else is now in this day and age in which we seek to continue to learn and share about African-American history and culture. I am the president of the Bethel Dukes branch, and I would just like to extend a warm welcome to you to join us. We won't press for membership. We'd like you to continue to sample and uh, consider joining us, and then we can discuss the nature of membership, which is two tiers, both national and branch and local. So it's not just simply a one level of membership. There are two tiers of membership to be considered, quote, a financial member of the association. We can get into the weeds of that later. I want to thank Demita Green, our person behind the scenes who's working so feverishly to keep us connected. And I want to also welcome you, the, the guests, to share in a conversation with Dr. Frazier. So thank you very much, and I look forward to our Q&A following. With that, we will go to Janice Sims Woods, who will introduce our speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. Today we have Dr. Zinga A. Frazier, who is director of the Shirley Chisholm Project on Brooklyn Women's Activism. She is also an assistant professor in the Africana Studies and Women's and Gender Studies at Brooklyn College. Dr. Frazier is a foremost expert on Shirley Chisholm and Black congressional women and Black feminism politics. She is currently completing her book, which is titled Sister Insider, 
Sister Outsider, Shirley Chisholm and Barbara Jordan, Black Women's Politics in the Post-Civil Rights Era. She has a forthcoming book on the contract with the University of California Press on Shirley Chisholm's intellectual legacy. She has appeared on several local, national, and international news outlets, and I'll just name a few, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Essence Magazine, C-SPAN, BBC Africa, uh, USA Today, the Chronicle of Higher Education, um, and the National Public Radio, and that's just naming a few. Uh, she has published several works. Her most recent essays is in the Brooklyn Review of Books, The Right to Be Elected, 100 years since women's suffrage that explores Shirley Chisholm's democratic legacy. Dr. Frazier's other works can be found in such magazines as Soul, a critical journal of Black political politics and culture, the Association of Black Women Historians Newsletter, Phyllis, a journal of African American women's history and other publications. Uh, she is the recipient of the 2017-18 AA. UW American Association of University Women Fellowship and the 2014 American Political Science Association Award in Minority and Urban Politics. Dr. Frazier holds a doctorate in African American Studies from Northwestern University, a Master of Arts from the Institute of Research in African American Studies at Columbia University, and an undergraduate degree in political science um, and African American Studies from Temple University. But before entering academia, academia Dr. Frazier was a legislative assistant on, the Cap on Capitol Hill. He is currently a sister scholar for the Delta Research and Educational Foundation in Washington, Washington DC. Her life abides by one of Shirley Chisholm's most famous quotes, which says, quote, service is rent we pay for the privilege of living on this earth, end quote. Let us welcome Dr. Frazier. Thank you, everyone. It's indeed my honor and a privilege to come to you. Um, and I'm thinking about all the amazing memories I have of attending Asala and working um, with uh, Dr. Jones. So I want to say thank you for this uh, invitation to the leadership of the Bethel Dukes Association of Asala. And especially thank you, uh, Ida Jones, who you know encouraged me as a graduate student. Um, and you know, it's indeed my honor and privilege because so much of the work that I do today really stands on the work and the legacy of the members of Asala, and specifically the mentors um, that have really mentored th me throughout my academic um, time have come out of Asala. And it, in many ways, you know, Asala is, is that place that you go to. There's a home, there's a space for us to do this work. And until recently, the work that I do on Black women, congressional women, even though it's a hot topic now, wasn't seen as a viable subject, was not revered by people in political science and other associations um, and other places. And so I indeed, it is indeed an honor and a privilege to come to you before today. And so I want to, to provide a discussion around Chisholm and this idea of a political rebellion. I'm gonna start with that kind of discussion. I have a PowerPoint, so you won't see me visually, but you will indeed hear me. And then I wanna have a discussion about the kind of public intellectual work that we're doing currently at the Shirley Chisholm Project. So I'm gonna start the presentation So do you all see my screen, correct? Okay, great. Just give me one second. Oops, it doesn't. Okay, let me fix it real quick.
Your mic is muted too, Zynga, when you get a moment. Okay, so we'll just start like this <laughs> and I'll move from each slide to slide. So this year's theme, African Americans in the Vote, is pivotal in this political moment and the ongoing struggle for Black people in the United States. The last two presidential elections, there has been a steady mainstream interest in Chisholm because of her many firsts, being the first African American elected to Congress and the first African-American and first woman to run on major party ticket for the U.S. presidency. We heard Chisholm's names in the introduction of Kamala Harris' vice presidential acceptance speech when she paid homage to the Black women activists and the elected officials who paved the way for her. Unlike President Obama and Hillary Clinton, who broke racial and gender boundaries, Harris consistently mentions Chisholm throughout her bid for the presidency. Black women scholars, especially Black women historians, have spent decades restoring Black women's rightful place at the center of American political history. These scholars have fought hard and long to insert Black women into the stories of suffrage and those who attempted to reinvent American democracy. The work and the mentorship of people like Drs. Betty Collier Thomas, Drs. Darlene Clark Hine, Rosalind Turnborg Penn, and Paula Ginnings are the foundations where my work on Chisholm stands. Yet just saying Chisholm's name, I would argue, also silences her. While Chisholm's visibility has increased, speaking only her name and not engaging her politics helps to disremember her legacy. In this current and social and political moment, Chisholm and her legacy provides a spotlight in a similar moment of racial reckoning during the late 1960s and early 1970s. When I think of a life and death and consequences for the nation and our world with, the pre with, these, with this presidential election, I think of how Chisholm emerges in the midst of, a po of political upheavals and urban uprisings in the North and New York City. Without a long contested struggle in New York against gerrymandering and the fight for Black political representation, we would not have a Shirley Chisholm. The fights today against Black voter disenfranchisement are the same battles that occur in the late 1960s in Bedford-Stuyvesant against Black districts fighting to elect their own representatives. Since Black since Blacks' enslavement, the vote has and continues to be a contested space. When thinking about my talk today, I could not shake Chisholm's word about rebellion. During a similar time when I see and hear the cries of Breonna Taylor's mother and hear the frustrations of young Black women in my classes, I ask what are the many ways we can learn from Chisholm's ability to rebel? With that said, I want to pose two points for discussion on the legacy of Chisholm's political life. First, Chisholm's political rebellion inside and outside of Congress. And secondly, the framing of Chisholm as a cultural icon. Chisholm connected to those who asked for a rebellion to take place in the halls of Congress. In 1969 at Howard University, she tells students, quote, if the time comes when I must choose between submission and rebellion, I must choose rebellion. I do not believe, I do not believe that the time has come, but the time is near, end quote. 51 years later, dare I say that the time is near. While Chisholm's own identity as a black woman operates as a physical manifestation of a political rebellion, her strategic decision to rebel against political leadership and power structure is what solidifies her as a political insurgent. While, frame, while the framing of Chisholm as a rebel and a maverick, <coughs> excuse me, it does not obscure her substance and efforts to transform our American democracy. And this slide that I'm showing you here really is, and these two quotes really 
provide a way of thinking about how Chisholm thought about institutions and the ways in which we talk about a symbolic representation. And Chisholm in many ways was not one who was an advocate for just a kind of symbolism. So along with her political foremothers, such as Ida B. Wells, Anna Julia Cooper, Ella Baker, and Fannie Lou Hamer, Chisholm's political rebellion attempts to transform the American, transform American democracy by inserting a radical humanism and intellectual critique that speaks to the universality of oppression while confronting patriarchy and white supremacy within, out, within and outside governmental structures. What attracted Chisholm to the masses was that she presented herself as an uncompromising advocate for marginalized people. She embodied what it was to be unbought and unbossed. Her political biography of working class immigrants, a former school teacher, and a political maverick connected her to, too, to, to many who felt ignored and invisible by local and national political leadership. It's important to note that while Chisholm is exceptional, she's also a woman of her time, where her own politics is connected to Northern civil rights movements and Pan-African struggles that take place in the late 1960s. Chisholm's elections are connected to a political experimentation that engage Black people to not only demand citizenship rights, but to reframe what is democracy. For example, Chisholm went up against political le leadership from the moment she arrives on Cong to Congress. Her first speech in Congress was against the Vietnam War and her declaration to refuse to vote for any defense appropriation bills from Nixon that did not completely address and fund public services. One of the most visual acts of her rebellion was her own, over her own assignment to the Agricultural Committee. Chisholm stands in the well, and this is something that I ask students to just imagine her standing in the well of the Chamber of Congress, protesting um, specifically the leadership around her assignment to agriculture. And she would um, similarly discuss that all people in Congress know is that a tree grows in Brooklyn. So outside of Congress, Chisholm is also engaged in a political rebellion against state violence. In 1971, Chisholm speaks out against the slaughter of inmates in Attica prison by Governor Rockefeller at the time, as well as the inhumane prison conditions inside. Chisholm saw Nixon's influence around law and order and Rockefeller's execution of that mandate as an incorrect handling of corrections and policing. And here at the slide, you also see what Chisholm is doing is she's, she also testifies against um, the leadership around the Attica prison uprisings. And she and one other Hispanic American who was in state legislator are one of the few political leaders that the prisoners asked to come to the prison to view what was going on and also the impact of her breaking up some of the riots. In 1972, when Chisholm launches her presidential campaign without full political backing of the Congressional Black Caucus and political elites, Chisholm runs being inspired by young people who articulated a political rebellion that went beyond racial and gender boundaries. For those engaged in, engaged in the women's movement and those involved in Black political organizations around the 72 election, many question whose candidate was she? Would she be the women's or the Black candidate? According to Chisholm's presidential announcement, she was neither. I am not the candidate of a Black, a black America, although I'm Black and proud. I am not the candidate of the women's movement of this country, although I am a woman and equally proud of that. Chisholm would say, I am the candidate of the people of America. Her campaign tested racial and gender boundaries and its efforts to build a coalition of marginalized voters. This was really strategic. In many ways, she was not only anti against anti-war, pro-choice, pro-labor, 
anti-racism, anti-racist, she also had a progressive agenda that challenged the Nixon's administration. Strategically, Chisholm knew that in order for them to win against Nixon, a marginalized coalition of people similar to the same coalition that elects Obama in uh, is the coalition that Chisholm attempts to create. But her rebellion against a narrowly defined identity politics identifies how Chisholm's actions were far more advanced than her current political moment. Even for those who oppose Chisholm, they would undeniably recognize her sincerity. We see that in the support in the support of the Black Panther Party who endorses Shirley Chisholm as their candidate and as the most consistent and loyal constituency, Black women who were also really central to her campaign. Chisholm understood how her political campaign aligned to physical rebellion. Reflecting on her campaign visit in Florida, she gives a speech at the courthouse steps that was placed adjacent to a Confederate soldier statue. She writes in her book, The Good Fight, a feeling came over me about the courthouse, a place of fear for Blacks for a hundred years, where white ju justice only existed, end quote. Confirming that she was invading the space, she remembered an old Black man commenting, I never thought, quote, I'd live to see a Black person speaking from the courthouse steps, end quote. Yet Chisholm navigated how her Black female body stood in a place that was a site of terror and grotesque horror for African Americans. Her presence as a candidate for the presidency sought to confront that history of injustice. Despite her bare bones budget and volunteer campaign staff, Chisholm succeeded in energizing a broad constituency of Black, Hispanic, Native American, working class women and youth voters. And the 1972 convention in Miami, she came in fourth out of 13 white men who were running at the time. Chisholm's inability to receive the Democratic nomination is usually framed by political pundits as a failure. Nonetheless, Chisholm successfully made it to the main stage of the Democratic Convention in Miami Beach as a presidential nominee. And when people say, and I get asked this many, many times, did she think that she could win? And in many ways, she failed at her attempt. I want to post to them in 2020, despite the crowded fields of women candidates, no one made it to the convention. But Chisholm did in 1972. Chisholm's participation to remake the Democratic Party, to force them to listen and negotiate with the most marginalized, as Fannie Lou Hamer did uh, years before her. So, while a romanticized and revisionist view of Chisholm may display her as a heroic woman and her political life reflects a happy ending, her legacy speaks to the tumultuous political life of a woman who bears significant political scars of her time, where she is both beloved and despised. Chisholm's legacy of rebellion has taken on new meaning for a new generation of activists and leaders, from Barbara Lee to those who mentored, who she mentored to her sole vote against the war in Iraq, to members of the squad. Despite being freshmen, they rejected operating and legislating as many would expect them, speaks to Chisholm's lingering legacy. And uh, the picture of Ayanna Presley which is ironic that she also uh, receive, is able to receive the uh, office that was formerly inhabited by Shirley Chisholm. Lastly, I would like to discuss Chisholm as a cultural icon. Unlike the women of the 1970s, Chisholm's political politics of style resemble many women in the civil rights movement who are normally adorned with hats and spectacles and perfect dresses, and Chisholm would also carry her fur coat that you know came to this May of others. And while her personal style was different from a younger generation of women activists, 
her fiery spirit and boldness connected her to a younger generation of Black nationalists and others who were simultaneously engaging in both a political and cultural revolution. And so Chisholm's kind of politics of style was very different from the Afros and the dashikis uh, that adorned many of the activists of that moment. Years later, Chisholm's political legacy is also translated to a younger generation that draws a continuum of the 1970s. She's referenced in, late, in the late 1980s in songs and art, and this occurs under the backdrop of Reaganomics and its severe impact on Black and Brown communities located in cities like New York City. Chisholm appears for a generation impacted by crack, trickle-down economics, and the dismantling infrastructures. Chisholm is significantly juxtaposed against Reagan, and she serves as an alternative for a new generation that was unable to vote for the first Black president in 1972. The insertion of Chisholm in popular culture suggests new ways Chisholm is being translated to a younger generation. With Chisholm appearing more, apparent, more prominently in movies and documentaries and within mainstream media, today we juxtapose and say her name and invoke her image against another political tyrant. The political tyrant of her day was Nixon, and now we use her as a juxtaposition of a political tyrant known as the current occupant in the White House. While some might find this invocation of Chisholm disingenuous, it points to the importance of art, culture, and how her role negotiates uh, to a new generation of young and old who walk by statues, buildings, pictures, and lick stamps, but have little or no reference to, the, to Shirley Chisholm's legacy of rebellion. And so I just kind of want to point to you um, what we're doing at the Shirley Chisholm Project. Currently, we hold uh, specific documents or histories, artifacts around Shirley Chisholm's political legacy as well as her life. And it's not only about Shirley Chisholm, but also the kind of long history in terms of resources for scholars and policy experts around Shirley Chisholm and the women who were engaging in politics in Brooklyn during the 1940s till today. And so a lot of the work that we do at the project is really what I consider the creation of Shirley Chisholm's public image. I've sat on boards and I currently sit on boards that uh, were pivotal in terms of, uh, if you see on the right, um, that will be the new monument that will be placed in Brooklyn, in Flatbush. That's the first kind of monument large scale monument to Shirley Chisholm in New York City, but the largest monument to an African American woman in New York State. Then you will also see on the other right, there will be a installation, a part of the Brooklyn Children's Museum uh, depiction around Brooklyn will also include Shirley Chisholm and doing the work with these specific cultural institutions are a part of the creation of Shirley Chisholm's image and the work that we do at Shirley at the Shirley Chisholm Project. Uh, one of our major programming that we do at Shirley Chisholm is the celebration of Shirley Chisholm Day. Uh, during our 50th celebration, we were indeed honored to have Sonia, Dr. Sonia Sanchez who is also a former mentor and teacher of mine, but what also attracted me to have Professor Sanchez come was her, she, she, create, she creates a poem. I don't think there's anyone who, during that time, who wrote a poem that included Shirley Chisholm. And there are pictures of students who are gathering to you know, listen to Professor Sanchez impart her wisdom, but also, recite her poem for Black women that includes Chisholm. And then a part of some of our illustrious speakers that we've had at the Shirley Chisholm Project have been Anita Hill, who talks specifically about the ways in which Chisholm motivated her and encouraged her as an African-American woman engaging in 
in, in entering in the law, Donna Brazil, who really touts Chisholm as a mentor of hers, Gloria Steinem, who worked along with Shirley Chisholm, and scholars such as Beverly Guy Sheftel. We've had Sherry Randolph and Robin Kelly, and as well as Al Sharpton, who actually was one of her youth coordinators. Um, and so a lot of the things that we discuss at the Shirley Chisholm Project for Shirley Chisholm Day have really revolved around the current and social political moments. We've explored everything from the state of Black women's politics to having an entire uh, weekend devoted to Black Lives Matter, discussion around Ferguson and policing in America. We had Karen um, Bass from Chicago who talked about the educational revolution, as well as the Scottsboro Boys in terms of the racial reckoning in America. And so a lot of the work that we also do is around social media. We've embarked on a campaign to talk about justice for not only for Breonna Taylor, but also to highlight policing and the impact of policing and the killing of Black women, specifically by police in New York City and in Brooklyn in particular. So uh, here is how you can follow the project and gain more information about what we do, as well as following the work and the current um, publications that will ensue uh, soon uh, for next year. And that I think is best that we get back to a discussion, <laughs> um, but that's just a preview of some of the things that we do at the Shirley Chisholm Project. Thank you so much, Dr. Frazier. Very insightful. I hear your passion and I can't thank you enough. I know you have been called to various parts of Europe, probably Asia and Africa in light of and such. So um, thank you. I would like to start our conversation very briefly with a parallel to Kamala Harris and this kind of transcendence of Chisholm and the fact that you bring in this 1969 speaking at Howard and Kamala is from Howard. I'm wondering if some of her views, because it is said that Kamala is kind of center leaning slightly right and not as left as she should be, in the political climate that Chisholm was in, in a very kind of similar climate, she sought to galvanize the marginalized people to create a majority for herself. Would you think Kamala will have the same kind of gumption in this very polarizing age we're in to kind of stand there and be something that Chisholm was, an outsider who was willing to say, okay, we can't all be in one part of the pond, but we have to have a sense of end goal. So what is the means might be different, but the end should be the same, a civilized democratic space for us to live. How would you look at that? Slightly so I, I would hope that you know, a lot of people are doing a number of references to Kamala, right? And I think I would hope that in many ways that we don't just connect them because of that kind of first, that's what I was saying, because in many ways that just remembers who Chisholm is. And I would really hope that she would align herself to the policies, to the initiatives that Chisholm was. Um, fervently against, right? When she runs in 1972, she has a platform for police brutality. She has a platform that talks about economic deprivation, specifically for marginalized communities. And because of Kamala's really center right, um, because of her past kind of legislative and judicial um, renderings when she was a prosecutor, one would think that not just aligning to the symbolism of Chisholm, but really getting herself ingrained in Chisholm's politics would be a benefit to Kamala. Chisholm was not about the symbolism of, um, of you know, being a representative. And in many ways, it put her on the outside, right? And she was not loved and beloved. We beloved her now, right? But she was not beloved during that time. And so Kamala has to, to get comfortable with being in those really uncomfortable spaces um, where she is going to have to, in many ways, stand up for those who are really putting their ownness on her 
right? And so it's also advocating for Black women in particular. Without the Black women who mobilized and lobbied, there would be, she would not be the vice presidential candidate. And Chisholm understood very poignantly the reason why she was in Congress the reason why she was running is because Black women, more than any other constituency, backed her, right? And so Chisholm, in her response, not only in terms of her belief, but in her response, also supported Black women legislatively. She didn't just support them symbolically, she supported them um, legislatively in terms of creating legislation for domestic workers for specifically talking about the trials and tribulations of what it means to be a Black woman in America. Um, and so the same is, I think, we don't necessarily only have to put the onus on Kamala, but really put the onus on specifically Black women for making Kamala, ensure her, ensuring her that she does what we're asking her to do for us. Because without us, there would be no her. Agreed. And I think that's a hard part for her to navigate that because she is so symbolic and because of the aesthetics of what that looks like. So versus a Stacey Abrams, who comes out very clearly in her rhetoric, very strong, unrelenting. And she also has a law background. So you look at the idea of being a lawyer that you kind of learn language and you use that. I don't really hear Kamala's voice. I see her. I don't hear her. And I think there's also a, fr a fear in her on some level to kind of be this kind of seemingly polarizing person because some of us aren't even looking at, listening to her, they're just looking at her and they accept her or reject her on that. But then I think we need, with all politics have gone this way, it's very superficial. And, and, and it serves no purpose, right? So there are always, there, there, there are segment currently that will always see her as an enemy. So the question is, not to talk to them because you're not going to get them in the first place, right? The question is, how do you devise a, a, an agenda, right, that speaks to immediately to the needs of people and not pander to those who in many ways are not going to align themselves with a Black woman who could be president? right? Like literally could be president. And so I think it just requires us to continue to have a continued engagement with her and not think that this is the end. Like the end is not her or her being the vice president. The end is us getting what we need for our communities. And I think what happened and what we saw happen um, in part of the critique of the, the Obama years was that there many ways there wasn't a political agenda setting that was needed to occur. And in many ways, that's why you do not see the gains specifically within the African-American community because an agenda was not set. And so this time around, I think African-Americans and specifically Black women are saying no more with the symbolism. We need to see uh, the bills, the legislation, uh, in some ways the money on the table for us to rally, to organize, um, because our lives literally depend on people advocating and understanding who we are. And not only, not only today and not only when it's election time, but the years down the line. And that's another good point. I had one person, Linda White, want to mention that she was in uh, Brooklyn at the time and actually uh, had the opportunity to read uh, Unbought and Unbossed and um, talked about the, the name of the school at the time was the School of Social Research. So um, she, uh, Linda, Linda Critchlow White, one of our members. But what I would like to also say in, in what you're doing with your work, are we talking to elementary and high school age women who need to understand that this is a lifestyle. This is not something that you put on in terms of, a, of a, a garment. This is my winter outfit. This is my spring outfit. Shirley lived her life, or Mrs. Chisholm, it's so hard to call them by their first name, yeah. lived her <laughs> life according to this, where it was a part of her being. It wasn't just simply a matter of the rhetoric, okay, cameras are on, let me get this, you know, it was a part of her being. And I think some of the, the marathon aspects of this, at least for the Black Lives Matter, I think they get it, although they've been kind of co-opted by the media, is that this is a marathon. You have to live your life in such a way that this win, lose, or draw every day will be committed to this cause. And I think if we get that understanding, and I think Kamala gets a little bit of it, but she's afraid of losing that market share that kind of celebrates her for the superficial. 
So who do I pander to? The real grassroots folks who I think, you know, are going to be with me or who are not popular? Or do I pander to the kind of the cameras and the, you know, society ladies who have my, you know, aesthetics in mind? It must be a very hard place to be because I don't really see her community of people. Like, who are her people? I know she has her sister, but I mean, you have your sorority, but where are your people? And I think... When I think about Chisholm, I always bring back, it's, there's, a, there's a great kind of um, way that she enters politics, right? And she enters politics because some two women come to her door. They have, I think, $8.75 worth of nickels and dimes. And they said that we met together and we believe that you need to run for Congress. She was already in the state assembly. And they said, you need to run for Congress and we are going to support you. And these women were from um, the projects, they were on welfare, they were on public assistance. And Chisholm says, these are the reason, this is the reason why I'm running, right? And so Chisholm was very in tune with who her people were, right? Because she was also of that people, right? Chisholm was not a woman of means. She was not a woman of influence, um, but she saw a way that Politics was only a means. In so many ways, I think this election is a means, but it's not the end of that means. And so talking about that kind of long legacy, and, and not only with Chisholm, but Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker and all of the women who really transform how we should think about American democracy, never were, were invested in just an election right? They were invested of mobilizing and working with communities to transform those communities inside out. And so the work of Chisholm and you know, the work of the Black women who are on the front line, specifically around voting disenfranchisement, people like Stacey Abrams and like Latasha Scott that are like, you know, having caravans pick up elderly and pick up young people to vote is about also educating them on the process, but also about engaging them in a community work that Black women do so well in terms of transforming that. And so, you know, the thing that kind of changed me the most as a historian is going to the Schomburg Museum and going into the papers of Ella Baker, right? And the ways in which she was invested and had faith I think what happens is we don't have faith in the people. And Ella Baker had such an entombed faith with Black people that it wasn't about her own agenda. When she would go into communities, she would just sit around and listen to them. She said, I want them to tell me what they need, not for me to insert what I think they need. And when you do that kind of grassroots, and that's what I see through a lot of the people who are involved in the Black Lives Matter movement, is that they are adapting that same kind of grassroots organizing to the work that they're doing. Um, and it's so important for us to kind of get back to those kind of basics and thinking about how we really transform democracy, whether or not, and, and you know, it's my, I, I call them the occupant. I don't name them by name. Um, you know, I do all of those kind of things. And I believe that it's, it's, we are in a life or death situation um, to get this occupant out. But I don't want us to think of after we got, after we get him out, the possibility of getting him out, that we stop at that particular moment. The time for us to move would actually be the day after. The day after we have a new president is really about what, what are we going to do? What are we going to demand from the vice president, the president, the administration? And what are we going to put on the line for saying that you will not use our votes, our likenesses, our mobilizing in vain? Pat Martin would like to ask, what do you think Shirley Chisholm's legacy would be, or what did she seek to leave in terms of a legacy, I believe? I think in many ways, the legacy of being unbought and unbossed, and not the kind of romanticized version of it, right? To say that you have to have a certain kind of political integrity for public service, 
It requires you to be in tuned and engaged to communities and listening to those who are different from yourself, but really not being a person around politics of the status quo. And in so many ways, I think that is indeed her legacy. Her legacy wasn't because she was the first, but it was about how to be unbought and unbossed in a structure that is created to dissuade people from having that kind of political ideology. I think we have room for two more questions. I think people are just tr trying to drink it in. As you know, our national theme was African-Americans and the vote. So um, I think there's something popping up here uh, from uh, Ingrid Griffin saying that um, she also had pr a program for teenage women and a finishing school for them to get their diplomas. So that goes to your idea of the sense that it's not electoral moments. It's literally a lifestyle of community building between those who should be voice for those people and those people who are in fact you. So I think there's a disconnect in our political age in which people now seek to um, disconnect themselves where there's politicians and there's you people. Well, if the air is polluted, we're all going to get COVID made that very clear. You know, if the water is polluted, we're all drinking. So it's made it very clear. So there's almost some level of divinity in this sense of uh, not moving away this vertical relationship and making it much more lateral. And, and definitely, a, yeah, go ahead. And she wasn't a career politician. I think that many, you know, what we're, what we see now, right? Um, she really believed that after the time has come, she was going to make her exit out and create a way for someone else. And I work for the member who takes her seat, but you know, I, I used to work for Congressman Owens who took um, Shirley Chisholm's seat. But she in many ways was saying, you know, politics is in a career. You do what you need to do. Hopefully you get something done and then you move on. And so in many ways she was a teacher. You know, she gets her master's of education at Columbia University Teachers College. And then she, she goes back to, uh, uh, to being a teacher, a college professor at Mount Holyoke. And so she saw herself not only as a politician, but in many ways an educator. Question from Demita Green. How can one support the Shirley Chisholm Project? Well, the, the last slide, and I, I will give you uh, those slides. You can uh, support us by going to ShirleyChismProject.com. And we, you can donate. Um, you can also support us and follow us on social media at Shirley Chisholm Project. Um, yeah, those are the ways in which you can support us. And so when is the book coming out? I know you've got 17 uh, things juggling in the air and you own this, so there's really no rival. And I guess, could you talk a little bit about Barbara Jordan well, see, in terms of this? they're trying to come for me. I don't know. <laughs> Well, it, it's been incubating a while, and I guess the, the, the money people or the book people are thinking money market strike while the iron's hot. But can yeah. you talk a little bit about Barbara Jordan as well? Because I know you also include her in some of your, your vision of what that era of politics looks like. So you have Barbara Jordan, a Black American from the Southwest, and then Shirley Chisholm of immigrant parentage in New York. The kind of mindset is very symbiotic. And so yeah. can you talk something about that? So, I mean, the work that I do on Barbara Jordan and Shirley Chisholm together really is the kind of comparison of how we should kind of think about Black women's politics during the post-civil rights era. And Jordan is, you know, the daughter of the South. Um, she is well-renowned and revered. And when I started doing the work on Chisholm and I visited Texas Southern University and did all of the kind of research, um, as well as uh, spoke, spoken to Marilyn Petrie, who is, who is a historian at TSU. And I literally was awestruck by going to the Austin, what is it, airport, and seeing the huge, huge bust of Barbara <laughs> Jordan. I stopped in my tracks and clutched my pearls, as they would say. I mean, she is my soror, but clutch my pearls because I had never seen such a monument to a black woman in such a public space, as if Barbara Jordan owned Texas, right? Like, it, it, so it, it really took me, why in so many, I asked the question, why was, why was Jordan so beloved? because she is beloved in Texas by whites, blacks, 
Mexican, all kinds of wide multiracial coalition. And in so many ways, because of being a daughter from Brooklyn, I am from Brooklyn, I did not see that kind of representation of, of Shirley Chisholm. And so that's how at least initial interest in the two. And then the more research that I did on them really spoke to the political moment of their time. But in many ways, like I say, speaks to the current moment that we're in now. So well, the, book, the books are coming. One will be out next fall. Yay! Um, and the other one will be soon to be released. Well, well, we will have to have you back, and I'm sure there'll be a documentary after each book as well. And so, I mean, because that's where we, people are very visual now. So, I mean, I still read, but people do like to, to engage in vision. Um, we have no more questions, but we have our thankful to Demita to put up to support the Shirley Chisholm Project.com and at Shirley Chisholm Project um, as well. So, I want to applaud you for your work and to thank you for carving out some time. I saw the husband, that was him, wasn't helping out. Yes. With the, thank him. <laughs> thank, thank your wing man. Uh, it's because of, because of, all the technical difficulties he's helped out. I appreciate thank, it. thank him as well as mommy. I'm sure she's in the other two rooms. But thank you so much, Dr. Frazier, for your scholarship and your commitment to live the life that you write about and to have the time to um, come to earth amongst us here in Washington, D.C. So I want to thank Dr. Zinga Frey, and you're our first recorded session too as well. So we're trying to get our social media platform up and running as well. I want to thank you all for attending. And I want to thank um, one other question here. I think South Carolina was not... Beloved because, oh, Shirley Chisholm was not beloved because she was too forthright, clear, and totally yeah. herself. And as a daughter of Barbados, that's how we roll. We're telling <laughs> you straight, no chaser. So New York was the best place for her to be. But I want to thank all of our guests. I want to thank you once again, Dr. Frazier, for your scholarship and wish you all the best, as thank well you. as your warm statements about the association. I know you are definitely a booster. So I want to just say, join us again on October 25th. We will have our next presentation and you're getting great accolades in the chat. And I want to thank Do Demita Green and Eric White, as well as Janet Sims Wood for their participation. So thank you so much and have a great academic year. And I look forward to that book in thank fall you so 2021. Much. Thank you so much for everything. Good night. Thank right. you. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.